Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. Does this quote sound familiar to you? It is popularly attributed to Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, who was a 13th century Persian poet, Islamic theologian, and Sufi mystic. Rumi's work and teachings have greatly influenced the literary and Sufi traditions of the Muslim world, and his poems have been translated into many languages across the world. Most notably, translations of his work to English have gained immense popularity, making him a best-selling poet in the Western world. However, most of his well-known quotes and poems, found on bookshelves and social media timelines, have been grossly mistranslated. For example, here's what Rumi was really saying in this quote. از کفر و ز اسلام برون صحرایی است ما را به میان آن فضا سودایی است عارف چو بدان رسید سر را بنهد نه کفر و نه اسلام و نه آنجا جایی است so the original is beyond kufr and islam there is a desert plain in that middle space our passions reign when the gnostic arrives there He'll prostrate himself. Not kufr, not Islam, not is there any space in that domain. This voice belongs to Muhammad Ali, who runs an online project called Persian Poetics that aims to accurately translate the work of well-regarded Persian poets and mystics. Starting off as a WhatsApp group for Muslim students in the U.S., Persian Poetics soon amassed a large following on social media due to its critique of popular translations of Maulana Rumi's poetry. Most notable among these translations are those by Coleman Barks, a popular American poet who has published numerous volumes translating and interpreting Rumi's poetry to English. However, since he does not speak Persian himself, his translations are considered to be inaccurate by some critics. In his interpretations, Barks minimizes Islamic references in an attempt to universalize Rumi's poetry. This pattern is found within the works of many other interpreters and translators like him. Within the context of anti-Muslim policies in the U.S. and the demonization of Islam globally, the decoupling of Islam from Rumi's poetry contributes to a damaging narrative that Muslims can only espouse values of tolerance if they are removed from Islam. Team Sot spoke to Muhammad Ali to find out more about his work and about the importance of dispelling mistranslations of Rumi's poetry. Hello, I am Charles Zadeh. That's my internet username. My real name is Muhammad Ali. I am the admin, translator, director of the Persian Poetics Instagram account where I translate Persian poetry, specifically Rumi and Hafez, and other people have been mistranslated by these new aged kind of colonized translators let's say where i try to correct the record on the spiritual tone and overall the accuracy of the translations that have been prevented or presented i should say in the english speaking world there's two aspects of it one aspect is that rumi speaks to everyone and he speaks to something that we all feel which is this desire to know more about what's out there god the afterlife spirituality uh yearning things like that he speaks to these really human feelings there's a lot of poets that speak to really specifically uh cultural events so if you look at religious odes that are aimed at you know a specific figure those are hard to relate to right but rumi isn't just a local saint he is in a local tradition but rumi started to emerge in translation because of people going to south asia and turkey but the earliest translations of him were extremely boring and dry and academic i'm talking about ones by people like um nicholson for example uh ronald nicholson or aj arberry and they wanted to just capture the most literal meaning of rumi as possible and they wanted to torture the poetry into rhyme and meter into english in a way that just wasn't suited so although their poet their translations did technically capture the meaning of rumi literally 
they failed to capture his spirit. So when you read these archaic translations of Rumi, you get literally everything that's on the page in the Persian, right? So if you didn't know the Persian, you just wanted to know what's exactly there, you'd get that. But you don't get his heart, and that's ultimately where they failed, right? Coleman Barks had, I think, almost the reverse of the original translators. The original translators were did a really good job of capturing the, the scholarly meaning, let's say, of Rumi's poetry and um, correcting the manuscripts and doing all kind of the, the nitty-gritty work that the average person is not at all interested in. Coleman Barks did the opposite. He did a really good job of capturing Rumi's voice and soul and spirit. So when you read a Coleman Barks poem, although it might not be very accurate, let's say, as far as the translation goes, kind of the mood that it inspires is closer to Rumi than the original archaic translation. But in that, let's say, in doing that, he also took out a lot of the important elements, right, that kind of make Rumi special to us. He took away the things that, that made him Muslim and, uh, you know, Khorasani and Persian speaking and Central Asian and uh, an Anatolian resident. You know, he took out all of those things. So he kind of ex excessively localized him, let's say. When Americans translate Rumi incorrectly, it's not the same as if, I don't know, a Japanese person were to do it. Maybe I wouldn't even care if they did. But there's an issue where a culture that has historically demonized Islam, that has, you know, invaded and destroyed Muslim countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, that has uh, sanctioned many Muslim countries, drawn many Muslim countries, just, you know, done so much against Muslim countries, demonized Muslims, has been Islamophobic, done a Muslim ban, and then also to, like Ivanka Trump did, quote, Rumi, well, as I said, you mentioned, if Rumi was alive and he wanted to visit America to, let's say, read his poetry at a university, the Muslim ban wouldn't let him do that. So, you know, it shouldn't be, we shouldn't forget that these, you know, these events don't just occur in a vacuum. Otherwise, it might be easy to think, oh, you know, who cares if just one poem is mistranslated? We really need to see these as part of the larger trend of the way that Islam is being really unfairly treated by other civilizations. We still understand ourselves from the lens of the West and the Western narrative still shapes how Islam is understood by Muslims. So it's not just that these translations are bad and that Americans are reading them. Most Muslims who encounter Rumi are also encountering them via the bad translations. So when I'm concerned about Coleman Barks mistranslating Rumi, I'm not really too worried about some random American person in Iowa reading a, a bad Rumi translation. I mean, they probably would never have the patience to read the real one anyway, but um, you know, it's just too foreign. But what I'm concerned about is the Muslims who read this stuff. And you know, I've ever since this project just started, I have so many people messaging me on two ends. On one end, people saying, I wanted to become a Sufi and I read Rumi and then I stopped being Muslim originally because I thought that Rumi wasn't Muslim because you know, being a Sufi is greater than Islam. And on the other hand, I have people messaging me saying, oh, I thought Rumi was, God forbid, was a kafir because, you know, here's all this poetry that I read. It's Colin Barks, of course, not the real thing, where he says, I'm not a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, I'm a Hindu, I'm everything. Or he says, you know, there's no more religions anymore. And Muslims, unfortunately, have lost touch with this amazing figure in our history. You know, Rumi was a Hanafi mufti. He was a scholar. He was an alim. He was a khatib. He had students, he you know, quoted hadiths, he, read the, he quoted the Quran, he probably had a lot of it memorized given how often he quotes it. Um, I mean, he knew Turkish, Persian, Arabic, he was, you know, as Muslim as anyone could be. But for some reason, we Muslims ourselves, because of this kind of post-colonial, let's say colonial hangover, we have misunderstood Rumi, I don't even want to say understood, misunderstood him through the lens of our colonizer. And I just think that it's very ironic that you know, these people love Rumi but hate Muslims at the same time. And I just say, you know, if you're Islamophobic, then Rumi isn't for you then. Either you gotta like us and respect us and then you can appreciate Rumi. Or if you're gonna be, you know, uh, supporting the Muslim ban and, and, you know, all these anti-Muslim policies, then no, you know, you can't love Rumi as well. We're, we're a package deal, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, even Muslims will message me, harass me sometimes, saying, hey, why are you giving Coleman Barks a big deal? You're just so stuck up. Just let them appreciate our culture. Why are you being so exclusive? 
Or sometimes I get people messaging me saying, you know, yeah, you're right, it's wrong, but, but just let it be, you know, some cultural engagement is better than nothing. It's a bridge, don't break the bridge down. Or, you know, I get all kinds of these mindsets, which ultimately I think is stemming from this desire to be appreciated by a different culture. And look, it's great if other cultures appreciate us, but we don't need that, right? Rumi is great on his own. We don't need him to be incorrectly popular in America for him to be great. He's already great. Some people say, well, Coleman Barks made him popular in America. I say, great, but I don't really care, you know? What's important to me is that we read him. You know, if different cultures want to appreciate it, great. That's why I even translate the poetry. But what's ultimately important is us. We're, we're the, the first group that really should be connecting to this, right? This is our spiritual heritage right and if other people are interested great you know as we say in, in arabic ahlan wa sahlan, khushum adid, in persian you know welcome absolutely read rumi but you know we're not changing rumi to fit your tastes you have to fit your tastes to understand rumi if you're trying to appreciate a different culture you shouldn't force it to just be like your culture you should really step out of your comfort zone so the same thing goes with rumi right if, if you want to read rumi you have to put in some extra effort to understand Muslim culture, you know. So I'll read you the original, my translation of the original, and then Coleman Barks' so you could compare. So the English. Come again, come again, whatever you are, come again. If you're a Kafir or idol worshiper or a Zoroastrian, come again. This home of ours is not a home of hopelessness. Even if you've repented 100 times, come again. And then the Coleman Barks. Come, come, whatever you are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. It doesn't matter. So here again, we're taking heavy words like Kafir, idol worshiper, Butparast, uh, Gab, Zoroastrian, and he's changing it to wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. Again, in our culture, Kafir, uh, Butparast, Gabr Zoroastrian, these are heavy words that are sometimes used by unfortunately sect, you know, sectarian or let's say extremist people to kind of uh, belittle other religious groups. You know, these people are Kufar, these people are Butparast, whatever. But Rumi is saying, no, no, it doesn't matter. Even if you're from these groups, you can still connect to God. You know, God is still there for you, right? And especially within the context of, you know, our diverse societies, you know, especially in South Asia where, you know, you have so many religions. This is a very powerful sentiment where a Muslim is saying, hey, it doesn't matter if you're a Hindu, a Parsi, or if you, you know, belong to Buddhism or whatever, you know, God is still there for you. We Sufis are trying to reach God and you're trying to reach God as well. And, you know, we feel no en enmity to you. And that's a very powerful sentiment, especially considering that there are people who feel the opposite way. When there are Muslims who unfortunately have very, you know, negative sentiments regarding other religious groups, for Rumi to say, no, that's not what we believe, that's a very beautiful message. But when Coleman Bark says, wander, worshiper, lover of leaving, you know, what does that even mean? Like someone who's just walking around in the street, like wandering around, you know, with nothing to do. There's no deeper, you know, meaning to that. When when Rumi says, kafir, butparas, gabr, Muslims think, oh, wow, you know, this is not just like mainstream. This is like a new idea. This is a new thought, right? You know, we haven't considered this before. So it just constantly, it just loses all of the deeper meaning. And then he says the, this Dadga home doorway of ours is not a doorway of hopelessness saying, you know, don't be hopeless, you know, we're hopeful people. He changes it to ours is not a caravan of despair. Caravan, you know, this like orientalist, oh, they have caravans and camels and things like that. And it's just comical to me that, you know, he could have just said church, temple, mosque. He could have picked any word. He had to pick caravan. So, you know, in the end, he actually kept it pretty similar. He changed repentance to vow, but, you know, I'll consider that. Baza, baza, haron chahasti baza, gar kafar o gabro bot parasti baza. In dargah ma, dargah noomidi nis, sad bar agar tobe shikasti baza.